Okay, thanks for joining us, Dr. Carson. Um, you just came from the 2015 Presidential Justice Forum at Allen University here in Columbia discussing racial injustices. And here in South Carolina, we've seen a lot of those throughout the past year. Uh, the Charleston Nine African Americans killed uh, in a church in Charleston, uh, the Confederate flag being brought down at the State House, the shooting death of unarmed black man Walter Scott. Why do you think in year 2015 uh, this issue is still alive? Because we're inhabited by human beings and human beings are imperfect. So you're never going to end up with a perfect situation. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to work on these issues, uh, to highlight injustices where they occur, and to try to find solutions. But a lot of the solutions uh, revolve around education, information. I mean, you look at America today versus when I was a youngster, and you see how dramatically attitudes have changed because people know each other, because they have information that they didn't have before. And as we continue to increase uh, the level of information that people in our society have, I think the areas where people act in a less than intelligent way will become less. And you said uh, in this forum that you think that you didn't have uh, any issues with law enforcement growing up because you were taught to respect police officers. In situations like Walter Scott where he was unarmed, he was simply disrespecting a police officer running away from him and he was shot and killed. How much do you think that's the fault of disrespecting a police officer and how much is police brutality? Well, it doesn't, doesn't matter how much you, you disrespect someone there's no excuse for the police officer's action. You know, that's just a rotten apple. That's a rotten human being. And I don't think you can, uh, can judge a whole police department based on a rotten apple any more than I could judge, you know, a whole news organization from one bad anchor. Um, talking about ISIS, uh, the attacks on Paris last week, um, in Mali yesterday, now we see Belgium has a heightened risk happening right now. What do you think we should be doing uh, to defeat this jihadi terrorism while also keeping Americans safe? Well, it's something I've been talking about for several months. Uh, for some strange people, for reason people don't pick up on the fact that what I've been saying is that we have to fight them over there so that they don't have time to come over here. And we need to eradicate them. In order to do that, we have to have a systematic plan. We have to strangulate them in terms of their revenues, make the, the banking systems uh, not cooperate with them. We have to get rid of their oil income. We have to take back the lands that they have acquired, their caliphate, make them look like losers. Uh, we have to work with our Department of Defense, with the Pentagon, with our intelligence uh, to ask them, what do you need in order to eradicate these people? Do you believe there are ISIS terrorists living here in the United States Of course now? there are. What do you think police should be doing or what kind of role should American police play in uh, looking out for this? Well, obviously they're doing a lot already. They have stopped a lot of incidents. I talked to the Secretary of Homeland Security a couple of years ago. He was telling me about all the things that they have stopped. We just don't know about them all. So they're doing a very good job. But we also must educate the public. The public must uh, be made aware of the kinds of situations that can occur and how they should respond when those things happen. You know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, they used to have what we call air raid drills in the schools. The uh, siren would go off and all the kids were taught what they're supposed to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. We need to be teaching Americans what to do in the case of an attack. Uh, and it will make a, a big difference in the number of casualties. As far as Syrian refugees, you've spoken out against Obama, you know, openly admitting these 10,000 refugees to the United States. You said, uh, you compared them to rabid dogs in a neighborhood. Well, I compared the ones who want to kill us. Now, rec recognize, see, this is something that people in the news media do all the time. They grab a little sound bite and then they exaggerate. Uh, what I said is those who want to kill us are like rabid dogs. Even if you are a dog lover, you don't want to expose your child to a rabid 
dog. That's what I said. And then they took that and ran with it and said, he says that all Syrians are like rabbit dogs. What a bunch of craziness. I'm looking for some integrity. Okay. And well, Donald Trump said that he believes there should be a database on all Muslims in the country, uh, had a very radical stance on that. Do you agree with him? I mean, specifically, what do you think needs to be done in order uh, to admit these refugees? Well, there should be a database on anybody coming to this country from any place, <coughs> not just Syria. Mm -hmm. um, we should always know who's coming into this country, particularly at a time like this. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, it's, we don't single out anybody. We don't treat anybody differently because of their ethnic heritage or their religion. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of people would say, I mean, the, the process for these Syrians coming over here is very lengthy. There is a very secure vetting process already happening. So what do you think more needs to be done? You need to be able to guarantee the safety of Americans because, you know, we already discovered people with Syrian passports involved in a French mm -hmm. incident. And then they found a couple of people in Texas trying to get across the border in Laredo. Uh, who are probably from that area. And we just need to be absolutely sure. And in the process, and in the meantime, we should be thinking about other alternatives. See, we get into these situations where we say it's either A or B, when in fact the answer may be C. And the C answer is we provide a safe haven for them over there, a no-fly zone at the uh, Turkish-Syrian border where humanitarian aid can be given, food, shelter, medicines. We try to resettle them in uh, Muslim countries over there. And we work on trying to establish a coalition government in Syria and a permanent ceasefire so that people can be repatriated in their own country. That makes a whole lot more sense than trying to bring them all over here. Okay, and, and John Kasich recently said uh, that he believes uh, that we should, it's the government's responsibility to promote Judeo-Christian values around the world. As a Christian, do you believe that's the government's responsibility? Of course that's not the government's responsibility. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're not out to proselytize other people. Uh, we're out to promote freedom and liberty, absolutely. And then lastly, uh, you want to be the President of the United States in a time where the threat of a terror attack is higher than it's ever been. Why should people vote for you, someone who has no political experience, much less foreign policy experience? Uh, because I have a lot of experience solving complex problems. And our country was actually designed for citizen statesmen, not for career politicians. Career politicians would have you believe that they're the only ones who know how to solve problems. But if you look at Congress, we've got 8,700 years of experience there. Where has it gotten us? What we really need are people who know how to get things done, how to work with other people, uh, how to utilize knowledge, and also how to acquire wisdom. Mm -hmm. And how do you think you'll be able to gather enough knowledge to deal with these issues that you've never dealt with before? Well, all I would say is all you have to do is listen to the answers that I've given about foreign policy and listen to the answer that other people have given. That should be all you need to know. Thank you so much. <laughs>